In this first unit, we'll look at setting up the Linux environment and take a look inside the Linux operating system to learn how the different parts fit together. We then look at what Bash is and how to use it in a terminal. Lastly, we look at how to access help in Linux to get assistance with Linux commands, which is an essential skill for all command line users. For those of you who already have Ubuntu installed on a dedicated computer, you can skip to the Customizing the Install section. Virtual machines, also called VMs, are great for testing, learning and running other operating systems side by side on your host OS. VMs are able to share the PC's hardware, like using its RAM, storage and network connection. Our host, Windows 10, will need enough RAM and disk space to handle Ubuntu as a VM, and the bare minimum required is 4GB of RAM. If your PC supports virtualization in the BIOS, this should be turned on to get better performance and more features out of your VM. We'll be using the free VirtualBox software to run a VM inside of Windows 10. For the install, we download the Ubuntu 17.10 desktop ISO file from ubuntu.com. And while that's downloading, we go to virtualbox.org and download the VirtualBox software. We install VirtualBox on the computer. In the settings for the VM, we choose the amount of RAM and storage space as well as the network connection. The minimum RAM required for Ubuntu is 1GB and 12GB of disk space. We also choose to boot from the Ubuntu ISO downloaded earlier. We start the virtual machine which boots from the Ubuntu ISO. We go through the default install options as shown. You can set up internet access by connecting to your wireless connection. I'll skip this because I'm using a wired connection. We log into our new install and check for any updates. For this course, we'll be using the full GNOME desktop environment. To install it, copy these commands in the terminal.
we choose option 1. Your Linux environment is now set up. Next we're going to take a look at the four main parts of the Linux operating system. The Linux operating system is made up of four main parts. Knowing the role each part plays is useful when using the command line and writing scripts. The Linux kernel is the brain of the system. It talks directly to the computer's hardware and is responsible for allocating resources on the system. For example, if the user turns up the volume on his computer, it's the kernel's job to interact with the speaker's driver to turn the volume up. In order to talk to the kernel and use resources, we use system utilities to talk to the Linux kernel. These are commands we use at the Linux command line. Most Linux desktop distros come pre-installed with a graphical user interface also called a GUI. We use it to easily interact with the system using the mouse. In Linux, the GUI is called the desktop environment. Finally, software installed on the system like Firefox for internet browsing or games for entertainment are designed to be run in a desktop environment. In this course, we'll be entering commands in the terminal, so let's look at the terminal window next. The terminal is your portal to the Linux operating system and this is where you can interact with the system directly using commands. To get to the terminal we use the shortcut keys Ctrl, Alt and T or we can search for it using the activities menu. The terminal tells us several things about the system. This is the username of who is logged in. This is the name of the system itself. This area tells us which directory we're in. The tilde symbol means we're in our home directory. The dollar sign tells us the user account only has user level permissions on the system. The hash sign would indicate root access, which is a special user account with full admin access. We'll learn more about permissions and admin access later in this course. We can also run terminals simultaneously in separate windows or tabs. The terminal shows the results of commands entered, but the actual interpretation of those commands is done by the bash shell. The bash shell is a program on the system that is set to run in the terminal by a setting on the user account. We'll look at that later in the course as well. Let's try our first command, the who command. By simply typing in the command and pressing return, bash looks for the who program on the system and returns the result of the command if found. The who command shows us all the currently logged in users on the system. Another similar command is the who am I command, which shows the username of the currently logged in user. We can partially type it in and press the tab key to fill in the rest of the command for us. This is a real time saver, particularly for long commands. We can do this again by only typing in wh, and because there is more than one match, pressing the tab key comes back with nothing. To list all matches, we simply press the tab key again. Partially typing in a half remembered command and using the tab key is an excellent way to list commands and by the end of this course using the tab key will become an automatic reflex. Another time saving tip is to use the up and down arrows on the keyboard to cycle through the commands already typed. Lastly we can clear the viewable area in the terminal by pressing Ctrl and L or using the clear command. I'll be doing this continuously throughout the course to give you an uncluttered view of what I'm doing. We can also use Ctrl and C to exit a running command. In the rest of this course, I'll be using the Tilex terminal. This app shows multiple terminals and panes without the need for separate windows, which makes it easier for me to demonstrate commands to you. You can continue using the standard terminal in Ubuntu or try Tilex. Full instructions to install Tilex can be found in the bonus video included in Unit 1. 
Next we'll see how help can be accessed directly from the terminal. Telex, formerly known as Terminex, is able to split your terminal window into multiple planes. This avoids having to open multiple terminal windows or tabs. All the terminals appear on screen in panes that can be rearranged and split by choosing from the horizontal or vertical options. This makes working in multiple terminals so much easier because you can see everything at a glance. To install Telex, go to the software app to find it and click on install. When you first launch Telex, this error will appear. We change this setting in the profile and when we close and open the app, the error disappears. We can go back into the profile settings to change the color scheme as well. To use multiple planes in Telex, it's as simple as using the shortcuts here or right clicking in a blank space and choosing from the menu that appears. Telex is a really useful app that has many other features. To find out more, you can visit the developer's website. You'll find the link included in this lesson. Let's move on to Unit 2. The Linux file structure can take a little getting used to if you're from a Microsoft background. The top of the file structure is the root directory represented by a forward slash. This is where your system is installed on your drive. Let's take a look at the root directory. These directories have specific purposes. Let's look at some of the main ones. The bin directory is where many of the commands will be used or stored. These are programs like the bash shell and uname that we used in the last unit. The dev directory contains files that represents devices like the hard drive partitions or the speaker. The etc directory contains the all important configuration files that determine how the system is set up. The home directory contains each user's individual files and directories. The PROC directory holds information about current processes and hardware. The SBIN directory contains programs used by the system or root user. The SYS directory is for system hardware information like network cards. The USR directory contains many commands used in the terminal. The var directory has files that change often, like log files. The Linux file structure is a virtual one. Although it looks like everything is on one physical disk, drives and their partitions can be mounted in directories. When we installed Ubuntu, it split the physical drive up into partitions and mounted the system partition in the root directory. The important concept to understand is that disks and partitions can be mounted in any given directory when working in the Linux system. For example, it's common to mount a separate physical drive to the home directory because this protects those files in case of a system disk failure. Next, we'll look at how to work with files and directories on the Linux command line. Visualizing the folder structure in a terminal window can be a bit intimidating at first. Let's start by finding out where we are in the file structure. The print working directory command shows us which directory we're currently in. The forward slash represents the root directory, which is followed by the home directory and then my directory also known as my home directory. The list command lists the content of my current directory. 
These are all the files and directories in my home directory. The color black shows us they are files and the blue shows us they are directories. Most commands are used with options like this. The L option lists all files and directories line by line which gives us additional information about the file or directory. The A option shows hidden files which are usually configuration files. We can identify a hidden file by the dot in front of its name. Most commands have many options and you should use the help keyword or the man command to find out about other options. We can also name files we want to list. For directories, we use the D option. To move around the directory structure, we use the change directory command followed by where to go, in this case the forward slash which represents the root directory. Using the change directory command on its own, we can quickly go to my home directory or we could use the tilde symbol which represents the home directory. To change into other directories, we use the cd command with the full path to the directory. This is called its absolute path. Here we go into the documents directory. To speed things up, we can partially type the path and press the tab key to autocomplete the path for us. If there's more than one match, we press the tab key again to see all matches. It's important to note that unlike the command line in Windows, the Linux terminal sees a difference between uppercase and lowercase characters. We can also use relative paths, which means we leave out the path that we're currently in. We can see with the print working directory command that we're currently in the home and then the captain directory. We use a relative path like this. In other words, we're going into directories relative to the directory we are currently in. Another time saver is to use double dots to go back one directory, called the parent directory. Whereas double dots represent the parent directory, a single dot represents the current directory. We'll be using this when we're copying files later in this unit. To find out the path of a command, we use the which command. Here we can see the list command is located in the bin directory, which is in the root directory. The file command is used to find out file types of files without file extensions. Here we identify several types. One last trick before moving on is being able to run commands in one line. To do this, we can run the previous commands using spaces and a semicolon. This saves time and shows the command in one line. To create directories in the terminal, we use the make directory command followed by the name of the directory to be created. We also use the semicolon with the list command to check the result. Another way to see the result is to use the V option. We can also create parent directories if they don't exist using the P option. The directory and its parents have been created as expected. This directory had spaces in it so we used double quotation marks, otherwise three separate directories named create, this and directory would have been created. There's another way of making bash understand spaces and that's the backslash. It has special meaning and we can see an example of this when I press the tab key to autocomplete the directory name. Bash escapes the space character with backslashes. Let's create another directory and use backslashes to escape the spaces. Escaping characters can look confusing at first, but it's used regularly on the command line and in bash scripts.
The touch command is used to create empty files. Here we create a file named file1. We can also create multiple files together. The command to delete files and directories is the remove command. Here we delete file 1. This deletes the file from the system without any possibility of recovery, so it's a good idea to use the I and V options. The I prompts before removal and the V shows what was removed. It's usually a good idea to use these options to prevent any accidental deletions. To delete a directory, we must use the D option as well. Non-empty directories can't be deleted without using the R option. This goes through all the subfolders and deletes them. The F option is useful for deleting files and directories that might not exist, but need to be removed without any prompts, especially in bash scripts. With this option we don't need to use the D option for directories. On the command line, we'll need to frequently make changes to important files, and as a precaution, it's always a good idea to make a copy before making any changes. Let's see how we can do this by creating some example directories. To create some example files, we use squiggly brackets to quickly create five files named file1 to file5. This is a time-saving way of creating multiple files in one command. We see the files have been created by using the list command. Let's use the copy command to copy the five files to the documents directory. We use the v option to show the result. The first argument is for the files to be copied. And here we use the asterisk wildcard to say anything beginning with the word file. The second argument is the destination location of where the file should be copied to. In this case it's the documents directory. If we run the same command again using the i option as well, the prompt tells us the file already exists. Using the I option is a good way of avoiding any mistakes. We can also copy files to the current directory using the dot. The dot is a useful shortcut for the current directory and saves typing long path names over and over. We can also use the R option to copy a directory and all its subdirectories and files. The move command is very similar to the copy command and is used to move files and directories. Let's move the five files in the sub1 directory to the current directory.
We can also move entire directories and their contents in the same way. The move command is also used to rename files. Think of it like moving a file to a new name. To rename file 1 to new file, we can use the move command again. File 1 is now named new file. We can also move and rename files in one go, like moving the sub2 directory into the current directory and renaming it to new directory. The cat command reads the contents of a file and displays those contents in the terminal. For example, let's see the contents of a file named passwd in the etc directory. This file contains important information about all the users on the system, including the location of the home directory and the default program to load in the terminal, bash. Using the cat command is useful for reading smaller files and using the N option to display line numbers is useful for troubleshooting log files. For longer files we use the less command and use the arrow keys to move up and down in the file. Here we see the contents of the hidden configuration file called profile which is for configuring options for users. We press Q to quit. The head and tail commands are useful to read the top lines in a file and bottom lines in a file. By default, the head command shows the first 10 lines in a file. The tail command shows the last 10 lines in a file. The head and tail commands are usually used for log files. Adding the F option to the tail command shows lines being added in real time. This is useful for viewing log files while they are being created, during a software install for example. Scrolling through text in the terminal can become tedious and time consuming. To make life easier we use search commands to find text quickly and that's what we'll look at next. The grep command is used to find text in files which saves time scrolling through text manually. In bash scripts the grep command can be invaluable in helping to automate many search tasks. We use grep followed by the pattern to match and then the file to look in. Here we're looking for the word captain in the pass wd file. The result of the command is returned and the matches are shown in red. Only captain with a lowercase c is matched. To make the search case insensitive, we use the I option. Now both patterns are matched. We can also use the N option to show the line number of the match and then quickly go to that location in the file using the cat command with the N option. Grep is a huge time saver especially when working with really long files. We can also use the E option to find more than one pattern in a file. Let's find both the nobody and captain accounts in one grep command. Here we're telling grep to find any lines in the past wd file with the words nobody or captain. Grep has lots of options and is a useful tool. For more advanced ways to find as well as alter text in files, we use stream editors. Stream editors view files as a stream of text apply the rules to that stream and display the results in the terminal without affecting the original content of the file. In this section we'll be using the group and pass wd files in the etc directory to run our stream editor rules on. The group file represents all the groups on the system and information about them. The stream editor we'll be using is the sed command. It's used with the name of the command sed followed by the rule to match, followed by the name of the file to apply the rule to. 
Rules are separated by forward slashes and in this rule, we specify an S for substitution. The word to find is captain and the word to replace is my group. We use the sed command and add the rule in single quotation marks followed by the group file. The result is displayed in the terminal but the group file has not been altered. Sed only replaces the first instance of the word it finds. When we run this rule on the passwd file, only the first instance of captain is replaced with captain junior. To replace all instances of captain, we add a g to the end of the rule. We can also use numbers to indicate which instance of the word we want to replace. Here we replace the third instance of captain in the passwd file. We can also use the N option and the letter P to the rule to only display the lines that the rule applies to. Remember, sed is a stream editor which looks at the stream of text, applies the rules we set and displays the text stream in the terminal without changing the actual file itself. When we need to save any changes, we can send the changes to a new file using the letter W along with the name of the new file. Here the results of the sed command are saved in a new file called results.log. We can also modify file contents directly by using the I option without the letter W. Here we change the contents of the file we just created by reverting Captain Junior back to Captain. With the power of the I option, we can very easily overwrite files by mistake. To avoid mistakes, we can use a file extension with the I option, which automatically creates a copy of the file with whatever extension you specify. Another useful feature of sed is being able to combine rules with the E option and a semicolon to separate rules. Here we change Captain to Captain Junior and Nobody to Somebody. To make sed case insensitive, we use the letter I at the end of the rule. When using multiple rules, we can also make them easier to read by separating them on new lines. Lastly, let's look at using sed to find words without replacing them. To do that, we simply set the rule without the letter s at the start of the rule and only include the word to find. On its own, using sed as a find tool is like grep, but when used with regular expressions, sed becomes a powerful search tool. In the next section, we'll learn about regular expressions and how they can be used with the sed command. Regular expressions are beautiful and ugly at the same time. Ugly because the patterns used look confusing and random, and beautiful because once you understand what the patterns mean, using regular expressions to solve a problem can be beautiful. Think of regular expressions as rules that describe what we're looking for. 
using special characters that the commander engine understands. The engine does the hard work of analyzing the input and matches the rule set. Unfortunately, different systems and commands use different engines so there's no standard set of special characters that the engine recognizes. This is usually where regular expressions cause confusion. We'll be looking at common regular expressions that are widely used, but you should know that the different commands have their own quirks. To understand regular expressions, we need to be able to understand the special characters used. The caret symbol looks for anything that begins with the specified pattern on each line. Here we look for all usernames that begin with S on each line. Here's some more examples. The dollar sign is used to find lines that end with what comes before the dollar sign. Here we find all the lines that end in the letter H. Here we look for any lines that end with no login because the dollar sign is followed by nothing. These are system accounts that are not allowed to log in like a normal user account. A dot is used to represent any character in between the characters we specify. The numbers in the group and the past WD files represent the user and group IDs on the system. Here we're looking for all the groups that have an ID of 100 followed by another character. The first result is 100 followed by a colon and the next two results are 100 followed by a number. Think of a dot as a placeholder for characters or numbers. Here's another example. The resolve.conf file in the etc directory is a configuration file that tells the system which IP address to use to look up names on the internet. We are trying to find the word resolve followed by a character in the resolve.conf file. We can see that the first two lines are what we expected because the word resolve is followed by a character, but the last line is resolve followed by a space. An important point to note is that regular expressions treat spaces as characters. After all, they are actually a character on the system. If we wanted to find all users that have bash set as their default shell, we would use something like this. When we run the command, we get an error because of the forward slashes used in the search. This is where we need to use the backslash escape character we learnt about earlier in the course. This may look a bit ugly and a bit confusing at first, but with practice, you'll start to see the patterns more easily. To learn about the asterisks, we'll create a file from the .bash rc file in the home directory. Here we look for the phrase color equals auto and send the results to a new file called new bash rc. The UK spelling of the word color is spelt with a U. We'll use sed to directly change the new bash rc file with the i option by adding a 1 in front of the substitution s. We make the change on the first line only.
We now have a file with two spellings of the word color and we'll use the asterisk symbol with the said command to find both versions. The asterisk when used with said is used to look for zero or more instances of the character before it. In this example, the U in color appears once in the first line, but zero times in the other lines, which is why both spellings of the word color are found. The pipe when used with the said command means all. From the previous example, we could find both spellings of the word color using the pipe to say, find the US version of color or the UK one. The only problem is that the pipe is recognized by bash as the symbol to pipe content to commands. We use the backslash escape character so that said knows to use the pipe for regular expressions. In the bash rc file, there's three matches for the word grep. Character classes are used in regular expressions as placeholders for characters that we're trying to find. Classes are contained in square brackets and each letter is matched with anything after it. Here we find a match for the word egrep but not grep on its own because the class specified that the word grep must contain an F or an E before it. These two character classes together look for a combination of a space followed by a G, FG or EG in the words. The result is that said finds two instances of a space followed by a G, one instance of FG and one of EG. We can also use numbers to look for a one followed by another one. A range of numbers can also be used to look for number combinations. In this case, we're looking for combinations of one followed by a two or three followed by zero, one, two or three. We can also do the same for letters to look for D hyphen followed by any letter from A to Z. Regular expressions are a powerful tool in programming in general and it's a large topic to cover. This introduction to regular expressions should help you tackle common tasks and serve as a foundation in your everyday scripts. Next, we'll look at how we can use the Vim editor to create and edit files. Text editors are used to create and edit files in the Linux terminal, and the vText editor is installed by default on most Linux systems. Learning V allows your skills to be used across several distros and will be a lifesaver when fixing systems in recovery mode because V is usually the only text editor available. The Vim text editor is an improved version of V, but everything you'll learn in this section applies to V as well. To install Vim, we use the apt command and sudo for admin permissions. For now, copy this command in the terminal and enter your password when prompted. The apt command is covered in detail in Unit 5. Vim is now installed. In the terminal, we use the command vim with the name of a file and press enter. If the file exists, it opens in vim, otherwise a new temporary file is created in vim. Here we can see in the status area at the bottom that this is a new file with the name myvim file. Vim starts in normal mode by default and in this mode the file can't be edited. To edit the file, we enter insert mode by pressing the letter I on the keyboard. We can see confirmation of this in the status area. Now we can use the Vim text editor like a text editor on the desktop.
To exit insert mode and go back to normal mode, we press the escape key. Only in normal mode can we save and exit the file. We press W on the keyboard to write changes and Q to quit. Vim only recognizes these commands if they start with a colon. We can see the file has been created. To open the file again, we use the vim command with the name of the file. We use I to edit and enter some more text, and then we press escape to go back to normal mode. We decide we don't want to save changes and press colon Q, but this error appears, which effectively means, are you sure you want to close without saving changes? To close without saving, we use Q with an exclamation point. In Vim, we use the arrow keys to navigate in the file and add some more text using insert mode. We press escape for normal mode and save the changes. To copy a line of text, we go to that line and press YY on the keyboard to yank the line and press P to paste that line. To undo, we press U, and to delete a line, we press DD. We can also use numbers in front of yank and delete to copy and delete more than one line. Let's save the file and quit. Files like config files can have many settings that need to be changed, and you can do this quickly when working in Vim. Let's open the new bash rc file we created earlier. In normal mode, we use the forward slash to find text. Here we're looking for the word color, and Vim goes to the first match after pressing enter. We can press the N key on the keyboard to go to the next match, and can continue to press N to cycle through all the matches. To find and replace words, we use a colon followed by a percentage sign and S for substitution. Here, we are changing the UK spelling of colour back to the US spelling. We can also add an extra forward slash and the letter C to make changes one by one, which allows us to review changes to important files and prevents mistakes. Vim has many features and ways of working that are beyond the scope of this course, but this basic introduction is enough to be able to write bash scripts in Vim. In the next unit, we'll be learning about Linux file permissions and how to use them. Text editors are used to create and edit files in the Linux terminal, and the vText editor is installed by default on most Linux systems. Learning V allows your skills to be used across several distros and will be a lifesaver when fixing systems in recovery mode because V is usually the only text editor available. The Vim text editor is an improved version of V, but everything you'll learn in this section applies to V as well. To install Vim, we use the apt command and sudo for admin permissions. For now, copy this command in the terminal and enter your password when prompted. The apt command is covered in detail in Unit 5. Vim is now installed. In the terminal, we use the command vim with the name of a file and press enter. If the file exists, it opens in vim, otherwise a new temporary file is created in vim. Here we can see in the status area at the bottom that this is a new file with the name myvim file. Vim starts in normal mode by default, and in this mode the file can't be edited. To edit the file, 
we enter insert mode by pressing the letter I on the keyboard. We can see confirmation of this in the status area. Now we can use the Vim text editor like a text editor on the desktop. To exit insert mode and go back to normal mode, we press the escape key. Only in normal mode can we save and exit the file. We press W on the keyboard to write changes and Q to quit. Vim only recognizes these commands if they start with a colon. We can see the file has been created. To open the file again, we use the Vim command with the name of the file. We use I to edit and enter some more text, and then we press Escape to go back to normal mode. We decide we don't want to save changes and press colon Q, but this error appears, which effectively means, are you sure you want to close without saving changes? To close without saving, we use Q with an exclamation point. In Vim, we use the arrow keys to navigate in the file and add some more text using insert mode. We press escape for normal mode and save the changes. To copy a line of text, we go to that line and press YY on the keyboard to yank the line and press P to paste that line. To undo, we press U, and to delete a line, we press DD. We can also use numbers in front of yank and delete to copy and delete more than one line. Let's save the file and quit. Files like config files can have many settings that need to be changed, and you can do this quickly when working in Vim. Let's open the new bash rc file we created earlier. In normal mode, we use the forward slash to find text. Here we're looking for the word color, and Vim goes to the first match after pressing enter. We can press the N key on the keyboard to go to the next match, and can continue to press N to cycle through all the matches. To find and replace words, we use a colon followed by a percentage sign and S for substitution. Here, we are changing the UK spelling of colour back to the US spelling. We can also add an extra forward slash and the letter C to make changes one by one, which allows us to review changes to important files and prevents mistakes. Vim has many features and ways of working that are beyond the scope of this course, but this basic introduction is enough to be able to write bash scripts in Vim. In the next unit, we'll be learning about Linux file permissions and how to use them. In this unit, we'll look at security in the Linux system. First, we'll set up some users and groups, which will be used to learn about file and directory permissions. Then we'll look at how files and directories can be shared by controlling their permissions. Linux is known for being a secure operating system. Linux uses user, group and other level permissions to control what level of access is granted. Think of permissions in terms of the least level of access a user needs to get things done. Those that only need to read a file shouldn't be assigned permissions to edit the file. Those that only need to read and edit a script shouldn't be able to execute it. Each user and group has a unique ID mapped to its username or group name 
and this is how the system enforces permissions. The root user is always assigned the user ID of 0, and the first 500 or up to 999 IDs are reserved for system accounts depending on the distro. Ubuntu user accounts start from 1000, and we can see that the first user account created on this system has a user ID of 1000. Accounts with user ID 1 to 999 are used to run services with only enough permissions to do their jobs. This minimizes the damage these accounts can do if hacked. In the terminal, we add a new user with the add user command followed by a username. We use sudo for root access and name the user ned. The add user command guides us through the process. We add the full name of the user and leave the other fields blank by pressing enter each time. We can check the user account in the pass wd file using grep. Each field is separated by a colon. To make this line and its fields easier to see, we'll use the grep command with a pipe. The pipe is used to pipe content into another command and we'll learn more about it in unit 4. There are seven fields for each user in the passwd file. The username, a placeholder for the password, the user ID, the user's main group ID, the comments field which matches the elements in the add user command separated by commas, the location of the home directory, and the location of the user's default shell. Let's add some system users, users Homer, Marge, Lisa, Bart, and Maggie. The user modify command is used to make changes to a user account. Here we use the C option to add Ned's full name. At the end of the command we specify that we're making changes to the user account Ned. When we look in the past wd file, we can see that the fields have been changed. To delete a user account, we use the user delete command. Here we use the R option to remove the user's home directory as well. The username of the account to delete is specified at the end. The command confirms the account has been deleted and the mail spool error is safe to ignore. Groups are used as containers to put users into, so that group members have permissions to access a file or directory collectively. For example, system admins may be part of a group that gives them access to all home drives, whereas users groups only have access to their own home drives. When new users are created, a group with their username is created as their primary group. They can also be part of secondary groups, which we can look at by using the groups command. This lists all the groups that my user account captain belongs to. Let's see the accounts that Homer belongs to. We can see he only belongs to his own group. Homer has decided to fulfill his lifelong ambition to become a screenwriter and wants to share his writing drafts with his family. We create a new group with the group add command. 
The new group is named Screenwriter, which will be used to give access to Homer's writing. The group file now contains the new group. My account belongs to my primary group Captain and several secondary groups. To add this account to the Screenwriter group, we could use the user modify command with the uppercase G option. On its own, the G option would replace all my secondary groups with the Screenwriter group. To prevent this, we need to use the A option, which adds a new group to the account without removing any of the other groups. To add Homer and his family to the Screenwriter group, we use both the A and G options with the user modify command. We check group membership with the groups command. The group modify and group delete commands are also available for modifying and deleting groups. Although the Simpson family is now part of the screenwriter group, permissions need to be set to access any files and directories. In the next section, we'll look at how permissions are set. We left the last section with Homer wanting to share his draft writing files with his family. We created a group called Screenwriter and gave his family access to it. Let's log in as Homer and create a drafts directory with some files. We can log in as other users in the terminal with the su command and the L option to specify a user. We create the drafts directory and create some empty chapters in the directory. Here we use squiggly brackets with a number range to create five files with unique names. New files or directories are owned by the user creating them and we can check permissions with the list command and L option. The first column indicates the file type. A D stands for the directory and a hyphen for the file. This column shows who the file owner is and this column shows which group the file belongs to. We want this directory to be accessed by the screenwriter group and we use the change group command to do this. The V option is used to display the result. The group name is specified next and the directory whose group will be changed is defined last. This changes the group for the drafts directory and not the files inside. To do that we use the uppercase R option to change the group for the directory as well as all subdirectories and files inside it. The drafts directory and its contents can now be accessed by anyone belonging to the screenwriter group. Permissions are controlled by users having read, write and execute permissions and each set of permissions is shown in this column for the owner, the group and anyone else or other. On the drafts directory we see that the owner Homer has read, write and execute permissions. The group screenwriter has read, write and execute permissions. Any other user who is not the owner or a member of the screenwriter group can read and execute but is not allowed to write to it. On the files we see that the owner Homer and group screenwriter has read and write permissions. Anyone else only has read access. Marge is a member of the screenwriter group and is able to write to any of the files in the drafts directory. To test we log in as Marge and use Vim to add a line of text.
When I try as my captain account, I can read the file, but I can't write to it because the captain account is not part of the screenwriter group. The captain account comes under other permissions and that is set to read only. File permissions can be changed with the change mode command with the permissions to set and the names of the files or directories to change. Permissions can be changed using symbolic or octal notation. For symbolic notation we use U for user, G for group and O for other. Here we use O for other. To add a permission we use the plus sign and to remove a permission we use a minus sign. Here we are adding a permission. Permissions are set with the letter R for read, W for write and X for execute. Here we are giving write permission. Lastly, we specify the file to change permissions on. Here Homer allows others to write to the chapter 1 file and when I try as captain, I am now able to write to the file. To remove write permissions, we use the minus sign. We can also change permissions for owner, group and other all in one go by using the letter A for all. We also combined R, W and X together, which we can do in any combination. Examples include RW. Rx and Wx. Octal notation uses numbers to represent permissions, where 4 represents read, 2 represents write, 1 represents execute and 0 represents no permission. When used with the change mode command, these numbers are combined to give a total which represents the permission set. Here we give both the owner and group read and write permissions and read only permissions for other. Homer has decided he is the only one who should be able to write to his drafts folder and its files. His family members should be able to read the files and anyone else should be denied permission. We give the drafts directory a 750 combo. Directories need browse permissions which is represented by execute which is the number 1. We give the files a 640 combo and use the asterisk wildcard to include all files rather than naming them individually. As captain I can't browse or read anything in the drafts directory but as Marge we can access the drafts directory and read the files. We can't write to the file because Marge is part of the screenwriter group which only has read-only access. Using either symbolic notation or octal notation, we can set permissions on individual files and directories and we can use groups to allow multiple users to access the files. Whichever notation you use, it's useful to learn both because you'll see both used in the Linux world. 
Homer's children, Bart and Lisa, have been forced to work on a school project together. For this, Lisa wants to create a directory that they can both use to share their project work. First, we create a directory in Root called Homework. We then create a project group and add both Bart and Lisa to it. When we look at the permissions on the homework directory, we see the owner and group is root because we created it using the sudo command. The owner and group can be changed with the change owner command. We set lease as the owner and set the group of the homework directory to project. The owner and the group is separated by a colon. Next, we change permissions on the homework directory for the owner Lisa and the project group to have full permissions while everyone else has read and browse permissions. As Bart and Lisa, we can see we are able to create files in the homework directory. When the files are created, they are owned by Bart or Lisa and are part of their primary groups. This means they don't have permission to edit each other's files. To correct this, we make all new files that are created belong to the same group as the homework directory by using the S option for group when using symbolic notation. This is known as setting the group ID and it's used when many users need to share files and directories with each other. An S now shows in the permissions, which means that any file or directory that is created in the homework directory will inherit its group. Now when Bart creates a file, the group for that file is project because the group is inherited from the homework directory. This means Lisa will be able to edit it because she belongs to the project group. File permissions in Linux allow us to keep the system secure while allowing users to use services and share files and directories with others. In the next unit, we'll be looking at the foundations of writing bash scripts, which includes coding skills that you can use with other programming languages as well. This unit covers many programming concepts and we begin by learning about scripting basics. This includes variables, arrays, parameters and getting user input. Next we look at how to control the flow of a script based on conditions using logic. We look at if-then statements, loops and string, numeric and file comparisons. Then we learn about sending data to commands and files. This includes redirecting data and getting input from files. Lastly, we begin writing and using functions to make scripts easier to maintain, understand and reuse. Bash scripts are text files usually with the .sh extension. The first line of the script is always a directive to tell the system which shell to use and its location. The rest of the script contains the actual commands that run one line at a time in order. The best way to learn about scripts is to create them. Let's begin with a simple bash script to list the contents of the root directory. We use vim to create the showfiles.sh file. 
The hash bang is used to tell the system to use a shell. We are using the bash shell which is located in the bin directory. This directive should be added at the start of every script. It's always a good idea to add a comment header to the script to help other users who might need to edit the script later. A hash is used for comments and bash ignores these lines when the script is run. Now we simply add the command in the script, just like we would in the terminal. Let's save the file and give it execute permissions. The script is now considered a program by the terminal and to run it we tell the terminal exactly where it is. We can either use its full path or use the current directory symbol of dot. The script runs and shows the contents of the root directory. Let's add some more directories to list in our script. We use the echo command with the name of the directory and another echo command without any text to leave an empty line after the listing. When the script is executed, we see the contents of the four directories listed. Although this script doesn't really do anything special, it shows how useful scripts can be to run many commands together in one go. This process is called automation and it's used to write scripts to do repeatable tasks based on specific conditions. Essentially, this is what programming languages are designed to do and you will find that many of the concepts used in this unit are applicable to programming in general. One of the tools in our scripting toolkit is a variable. Think of variables in terms of containers that hold data. The container has a unique name and the data held can be changed at any time. We create a script called variables.sh. We create a variable named text var and give it a value and then we create another one called integer var and give it a value. Variable names are case sensitive and last for as long as the script is running. Usually, lowercase letters are used for script variables and there should be no spaces in the name. The name is followed by an equal sign and the value of the variable to be set. We save the script, make it executable and run it. Nothing happens because although we set the variables, we didn't use them. Any time we want to use a variable, we add a dollar sign in front of its name. This tells bash to display its value. When this script runs, two variables are set and given values. Those values are displayed with the echo command. Variables can also hold the results of other commands. Here we use the uname command to store the kernel version of the system in a variable called k version. This is called command substitution and is done by using a dollar sign with brackets that wrap around the command. Variables are useful for holding values that we need to use in our script. Linux also uses system variables to hold values that it uses while the system is running. These are known as environment variables. For example, when we run commands in the terminal, there are predefined locations that bash looks for to find those commands. These locations are held in a system variable named path. Environment variables are usually uppercase and are accessed continually to make the system run correctly. Not all environment variables are the same across Linux distros and when using them in scripts, you should test to see if they are available. Variables also have a scope which means they can be global or local. In our script, the variables are local to the script and their values can't be accessed outside of the script. Environment variables are global in scope because they can be accessed from everywhere, like from the desktop environment, the terminal, and in scripts. 
An array is a variable that can hold multiple values, almost like a container with lots of smaller containers. We assign multiple values to an array by using brackets to wrap the values and spaces to separate them. Here we create an array called usernames array and assign it six values. To use these values in scripts, we used the dollar sign as before, but use squiggly brackets to tell bash the variable is an array. We also use square brackets with the position of a value to use. Arrays always start from 0 and not 1, so position number 1 has a value of Clark and not Bruce. Here's the values of position 0 and 5. We can also use an asterisk to show all values in the array. Values in arrays can be deleted using the unset command with the position of the value. Here we delete the value Victor from the array. You should use arrays in scripts to hold many related values in one variable, because they are an efficient way to manage large amounts of data. Parameters are values that are added to commands to customize its output. For example, the list command on its own shows the contents of the current directory. Adding a directory name changes its output. Parameters make commands and scripts more usable. To learn about using parameters, we'll create a script called inputdata.sh. The hashbang and comment header is added and the script is given execute permissions. We run the script and add three parameters, A, B, and C. When the script runs, Bash automatically creates special variables for those values which are named $1 through to $9. We can use these special variables in our script to work with parameter values. Here we echo those values. Let's look at some of the other special variables that Bash creates when a script runs. The zero variable is the name of the script being run. The hash variable is the total number of parameters entered. The asterisk holds all the parameters in a long text string and the at variable holds all the parameters in an array. We can use parameter values in scripts and the shift command is a useful tool to do this. It automatically shifts the list of parameters by one so that we can look through each parameter in order. Here we echo the first parameter value and shift the list by 1 so that $1 now has the next value. We can also use the shift command to go directly to a specific parameter value. The shift command is a one-way trip which means once you've shifted the previous values are lost and they can't be used for the rest of the script. Bash scripts can be silent or can be interactive. The script might prompt the user to quit, enter a server name or enter a username. For this kind of input, we use the read command. The read command pauses the script for user input and stores the response in a variable that can be used in the rest of the script. We'll create a script called interactive.sh to learn how the read command works. Let's have a quick conversation with the read command. The parameter after the read command is the name of the variable to store user input.
When we run the command, the script pauses until a response is entered and that response is used in the echo commands. In the next section, we're going to look at how we can process parameters and interactive input to make decisions in our script. Logic and decision making is at the heart of scripts and computer programs. The script makes decisions based on conditions and takes actions based on what it finds. In this section, we'll create a to-do app that will organize tasks for the day. The script will be for a writer who creates daily writing tasks. More time is allocated automatically to priority tasks based on keywords in the task name. The script will use many scripting tools that are used to evaluate conditions and will use logic to control the flow of the script. We'll create a file named mytasks.sh, add a comment header and make the file executable. It's a good idea to plan scripts. We do this by adding some comments to identify the main parts of the script. Breaking the script down into smaller parts makes it easier to work with and we will be working on each part one by one. First, we use an if statement. The if statement is used to say, if something is true, then do this. The statement is closed with the fee keyword, which is if spelt backwards. We use string comparison to check if parameter 1 is equal to the help keyword, which is wrapped in square brackets. The double quotation marks are used to tell Bash we expect a text string. If the help keyword is the first parameter, we need to tell the if statement what to do after the then clause. We display help on using the script. The next step is to create the files, which we can do by adding an else clause in our if statement.
The else clause is what to do if the if statement is false, which would mean parameter 1 isn't the help keyword. There's another clause called else if, which we can use to test another condition and keep telling the if statement what to do if each clause is false. For this script, we don't need the else if clauses. In the else clause, we check to see if the directory called tasks exists and create it if it doesn't by using another if statement. To check for the directory, we use file comparisons. The D operator returns true if the directory exists, so we add an exclamation point in front of it to say if the directory tasks doesn't exist, then create it. We can test it by running the script and check to see if the directory was created. To create the files, we use a for loop. Loops are used to go through a collection of values so that something can be done with each value. In this case, we'll be using the script with task names that we want to create files for. With the for loop, we can go through all the task names and create a file with that name. Here, the for loop goes through each value in the $at collection and holds it in the variable we're going to name task name. We use the touch command to create each file in the loop and name each task and include the .txt file extension. While looping through the task names, we're also going to check to see if any of our keywords are included in any of the task names. For that, we're going to use a case statement, which is used to find a value and take action if the value is found. It's similar to an if statement with lots of else if clauses. The case statement looks in a list of items and tries to find a match with the values we specify. Each item in the list is held in a variable that can be given a name that's then used in the case statement. If no match is found, the asterisk represents any default actions to take. The case statement is closed with a ESAC, which is case spelled backwards. In this script, we're looping through each task name and we'll use a case statement to find matches for the two keywords, research and chapter. We don't need a default action, so we leave the asterisk match out. To find matches for the word anywhere in the task name, we use the wildcard asterisk symbol at the start and end of the words. Before we decide what to do if the keywords are found, we set up a counter variable. We set the initial value to 0 outside of the loop because we start off with no priority keywords. If any are found, this counter will count how many there are. If we find a keyword match in the case statement, we want to add 1 to the counter variable. To do basic maths calculations, we need to use square brackets with spaces. Next, we store any priority task names in a priority tasks variable. We're creating a string, so we use quotation marks and build the text string by appending any priority task found. At the start of the loop, the variable ptasks is empty, but every time a keyword match is found, the string gets longer. Now we need to figure out how to allocate the 8 hours available for each task, taking into account priority keywords. These tasks will be allocated twice the amount of time than other tasks, so we need to divide the 8 hours into available time blocks. We work these out by adding the total number of tasks and the number of priority tasks using the priority tasks counter. To convert each time block into minutes, we multiply 8 hours by 60 minutes and divide the result by the total number of time blocks available.
We declutter the terminal screen with the clear command and echo the list of tasks that need to be completed. Next we echo the header of our task list with the E option so that we can use the special tab escape character to space out the columns in the list. We now need a way to loop through each task name and print the names on screen along with a calculated value of how much time is allocated for each task. For this we need a while loop which will continue looping while something is true. For example we could say continue looping while a variable is 3 or continue looping while a command is true. You should use while loops when you expect that the value of something will eventually become false. Here the loop will carry on looping and do something here while the condition is true. We want to continue looping while the total number of tasks is more than zero. For that we use the numeric comparison symbol GT which stands for greater than. Here the loop will continue while the number of total parameters is more than zero. In the do part of the loop we'll use the shift command to shift each parameter by one each time the loop repeats. Eventually there will be no more parameters left and the $1 variable will be zero. When this happens the loop will stop. We create another counter variable to show a task number. If the shift command was never used the parameters count would never reach zero and the loop would never stop. This is called an infinite loop and you should make sure that the value your loop checks will at some point become false. To display a task number for each task, we created the task count variable. Each time the loop repeats, we increase the value of task count by 1 by using some simple maths. The header for our task list should display each task number, its time allocation and its name. We do this by using the echo command with the E option. We echo the task number, a tab, a time variable that will call the time allocation, another tab and the $1 variable that contains each task name thanks to the shift command. The last thing left to do is calculate a time allocation for each task based on its priority. To do that we check if the current task name in the loop is a priority task by trying to find its task name in the priority task variable ptasks. We do this by using grep to do the finding and the pipe to feed the grep command. The Q option with the grep command is used to suppress the result of grep in the terminal. If the task name is found in the priority task variable ptasks, we'll assign the allocation time variable twice the time blocks, otherwise we'll only assign one time block. The script is now finished and you should take a few minutes to look over it and make sure you understand its logic. Let's run the script and test it with the help keyword first. The if statement is true, so the help content is displayed on screen, just like a standard bash command. Now let's try it with four task names. We use hyphens instead of spaces for task names, otherwise bash assumes each word is a new parameter. The result is a tab separated listing of each task with time allocated in minutes. The tasks directory has also been created along with the four task files. Let's recap how the script works. The script logic flows to the else part of the if statement and the nested if statement creates the task directory. Next the for loop creates each task file and the case statement counts the number of tasks and creates a string of all the priority tasks. After calculating how many time blocks to create, the script clears the screen and displays the tasks header. Finally the last while loop checks for priority tasks and allocates double time for them and then displays each task, looping until the shift command has shifted through all the task names. For time calculations we use square brackets for simple maths, but this is limited to whole numbers only.
Dividing 480 by 7 gives us a decimal number. To do this calculation in the bash calculator, we echo the calculation as a string and pipe it to the bash calculator command. We can also add scale equals 1 to tell the calculator to show the result to one decimal place. To prevent numbers being rounded in the To Do app, you could alter it to use the bash calculator instead. In this section, we looked at how to control the flow of scripts using logic, and in the next section, we'll look at how we can control data in our scripts in terms of input and output. A command typed in on the keyboard is known as standard input, and the result we see on screen is called standard output. When a command is run with an error, the error displayed is known as standard error. We can control these inputs, outputs and errors depending on what we need to do. For example, for scripts to run silently, we ignore standard output. We do this by using the forward arrow to redirect standard output. This type of redirection creates a new file and overwrites any existing file. To keep the existing file and instead add to it, we use two forward arrows. We can also feed standard input to commands by using the back arrow. Here we feed the grep command with the contents of a file. To feed a command multiple lines on the command line, we use two back arrows with a marker. The marker simply tells bash when the lines start and when they finish. The end of file marker is commonly used. Pressing the return key allows us to add lines of text. Once finished, we use the marker to tell bash it was the last line. We can also use Linux file descriptors to redirect data. 0 identifies standard input, 1 identifies standard output, and 2 identifies standard error. Let's run the cat command on two files, one that exists and one that doesn't. Standard output for the first file is displayed, followed by a standard error for the second one. Using file descriptors, we run the same command but send standard out and standard error to separate files. We use file descriptor 1 for standard out and file descriptor 2 for standard error. Now standard out is in the results file and standard error is in the error log file. To send both standard out and standard error to the same file, we use the AND symbol. There are times when we don't need to see any output or errors, we just need the script to run. To disregard any output, we send it to a special file in the dev directory called null. Think of this file like a special rubbish bin. Anything thrown in here disappears and can't be recovered. Here we send both standard output and standard error to the null file. Another way to control what happens to standard out is by using the pipe that we've used in previous sections. The pipe connects commands together by taking standard out from one command and making it standard in for another command. Here's an example. When we use sed to find and replace text, it shows all results and not just the ones that were changed. We can make it easier to see changes by piping the results of sed to the grep command, which is piping the output of sed and making it the input of grep. 
Now we only see the lines that were changed, with grep highlighting the name Max Power. Piping makes processing data easier because it allows us to work directly with output from other commands. Controlling the flow of input and output in scripts helps to make automation easier. Next, we'll look at how to write less code by making code repeatable. In bash scripts, you'll begin to find times when you need to use the same lines of code more than once in the same script. Functions are used to group lines of code that need to be used more than once. Whenever those lines of code are needed in the script, the function is called by name and those lines are executed. This saves time coding and makes scripts shorter. Reusing code also makes maintaining scripts easier because a change can be made once in the function instead of in several areas of the script. Functions can also be used in other scripts by simply copying and pasting them and then calling them in the main part of the script. Splitting your code up into smaller parts that deal with specific tasks not only makes coding simpler, it makes the script easier to follow, especially when you come back to it at a later date. To learn about functions, we'll be creating a script with an easy to use interface that shows information about the system. We create the script and call it systeminfo.sh and make it executable. We plan our script by adding comments to lay out the main parts of the script. We start by creating a function named show interface. The keyword function is followed by a name and two opening and closing squiggly brackets that are used to hold the code. We echo a greeting in the function and add five options to choose from. Lastly, we call the function in the script, which executes the contents of the function when the script is run. We can see the greeting is displayed along with the five options. Think of functions like tasks waiting to be completed. Once called in the script, they go to work. Next, we accept input from the user with the read command and name the response variable chosen option. This will hold the option number chosen by the user. To find out which option the user chose, we'll create another function called getOptionResults. To hand over script control to that function, we call it in this function. We create the get options results function and use a case statement to match the option picked. The number the user enters is held in the chosen option variable and it should be a number from 1 to 5. If it's not, the default match in the case statement will do nothing. This is used to ignore anything other than numbers from 1 to 5. 
For option 5, we clear the screen, show a goodbye message, and use the exit command to stop the script. Lastly, in this function, we hand back control to the show interface function. When we test the script and try the options, the script alternates back and forth between the two functions until we use option 5 to quit. The final part of this script gets system info and displays it to the user. We'll create four functions to handle each task. Each function is named to reflect its purpose. To get the kernel version, we use the uname command with the R option. In the finish script, there are two separator hyphens and we add those in the front. To get the version of Ubuntu, we use the OS release file in the etc directory that has a list of variable names with information about the Ubuntu system. To read the file into memory, we use the dot symbol to source the file and then echo the variable pretty name. To get the name of the system, we use the hostname command and use command substitution to echo its result. To list all users on the system, we use the grep command to identify any users who have bin bash included in their login information. Any users that don't have this are system accounts that we don't want to list. Each field is separated by a colon and we'll use the cut command to extract only the username per line. The cut command is able to extract information based on delimiters, which in this case is a colon. To specify this, we use the D option. With the F option, we return only field 1, which is the username. In the script, we pipe the results of the grep command to the cut command. To echo the result, we add two hyphens and use command substitution to hold the results of grep and cut. We call the functions in the get option results function and assign them to variable names. Lastly, we add these variables next to each option so that they display when they hold a value. To finish the script, we'll add some color with some special color codes that the terminal understands. We'll assign these codes to variables and wrap them around the results from the previous four functions. The first color code is red and the last one is to go back to the default text color. Let's test the finished script.
When the script runs, the show interface function is called, which clears the screen and echoes the interface. The read command waits for input and then calls the get option results function, which matches the chosen option. The call to the correct function is made and the result of the function is assigned to a variable. The show interface function is called again and the variable now has a value which is displayed. This calling of functions continues until option 5 is used to exit the script. Defining functions and scripts sections of code into easier to write and manage chunks. In the next section, we'll create some more scripts to manage software, create backups and monitor disk space. In this last unit, we'll learn about installing and managing software on an Ubuntu system and create a script to automate the process. Next, we'll use cron to schedule scripts so that they run automatically at regular intervals. We'll combine this with archiving and compressing files to create backups of files and directories. The last script in this unit creates automated reports that can be used to monitor disk usage on a Linux system. All Linux distributions use package management systems to keep track of its installed software, including files installed for each package and its version. Packages are all the files needed to install the app. The package management system also locates and installs dependencies. These are any other packages that might be needed before the software can be installed. Packages are stored on the distro's official servers in repositories also called repos. The Linux system connects to these servers regularly to compare its packages with the ones in the repos. If a package has a newer version, the system prompts to install updates. To demonstrate the packaging system used in Ubuntu, we'll create a script to automate updating the system, removing unwanted software and installing new software. This script could be used to save time after installing Ubuntu for the first time, for example. The script will have three supporting files. The install.log that's generated by the script to help with troubleshooting. The uninstall.conf that contains a space-separated list of software to remove. The install.conf that contains a space-separated list of software to install. We'll create a script called postinstall.sh and make it executable. We use five functions to make the script easier to read and update. They create a log file, show the script's progress at each stage, update the system, uninstall unwanted software and install new software. In each function, we add an echo command placeholder to avoid any errors when testing the script. Throughout the script, we send standard output to screen as well as to a log file by using the t command. The t command creates the log file and will overwrite the file each time the function is called. To avoid this, we use the A option with an if statement and file comparison clause to check to see if the file exists. The A option appends to the file instead of overwriting it. To make the script more user friendly, we show the progress of the script at each stage using a parameter when calling the function and a case statement.
Here we check the $1 variable, which we expect to be a number from 1 to 4, to match the four stages of our script. Ubuntu uses the package management system apt, which requires administrator privileges. We use the sudo command with apt followed by update. This updates the repository information the software has and checks for newer versions of software. Upgrade is used to upgrade any software that has newer versions. We also add the yes option to prevent any prompts during the execution of our script. The next function removes any unwanted default software installed in Ubuntu. We use apt again with purge to remove all files. If you prefer not to remove config files, you can also use remove. To automate the process of removing software, we're expecting a uninstall.conf file with a space separated list of software to remove. We use command substitution with the cat command to feed apt with a list of software to remove. Auto remove is used to clean up any files left over by the uninstall process. In this function, we expect an install.com file with a space separated list of software to install. This file is fed to the apt command in the same way as before. To install software with the apt command, we use install. Each function is now set to perform a specific task and the next thing we need to do is write the main part of the script. Before we do anything, we delete the install.log file so that we always begin with a fresh log file. On a new system, we wouldn't expect the file to be there, but it's a good idea to consider all possibilities when writing scripts. To avoid any errors, we redirect file descriptor 2 to the special null file. Throughout the script, we'll call specific functions when needed and send their output to the fill log function. The function shows results on screen and also sends them to the install.log file using the t command. To send output to the fill log function, we use the pipe. Stage 1 updates the system, so we use the show progress function with a parameter of 1. And then we call the update system function. Stage 2 uninstalls any unwanted default software, so we use the show progress function again with a parameter of 2. We use the remove software function, which relies on the install.com file. There are three possibilities when we call this function. The uninstall.com file exists and contains a software list to remove. The file exists but is blank. The file doesn't exist. To deal with these situations, we use an if statement with file comparison clauses to check for the file. If the file exists and is not blank, we call the remove software function. If the file is blank, we echo some feedback. If the file doesn't exist, we help the user create it. We use the read command to let the user read the message and then open a blank file in Vim. The user has the option to leave the file blank or add a list of software. After the user saves the file, the script resumes. There are now two possibilities. The uninstalled file exists and is not blank. The file exists and is blank. We use a nested if statement to deal with the two situations as before.
The logic for stage 3 installing software is largely the same as removing software, so we copy all the lines for removing software by using the yank and paste shortcuts in Vim. Now we make changes to the copied text. Stage 4 reboots the computer, which can be done by using the system control command followed by reboot. The script is complete and will test the script later after we learn some more features of the apt command. We can use apt to look for software to install or remove on the system. We use list to show all available software. and the installed option to filter for all installed software on the system. To look for standard software installed with the GNOME desktop, we can filter further by using the asterisk to find anything beginning with GNOME. To find software to add, we can use list with a partial word and an asterisk. To check information about the package, we use show followed by the name of the software. To test the script, I've created a virtual machine with a fresh install of Ubuntu. The script has been copied and made executable. In stage 1, the system updates. In stage 2, the uninstall.com file is created and the software in the file is removed. In stage 3 the install.conf is created and the software in the file is installed. In stage 4 the computer is restarted. When we check the log file, we see a full account of what the script did. Here's another virtual machine with a fresh install of Ubuntu. Here I've created the two configuration files and so this time the script is fully automated.
Whether you use the script for your home computers, your small office setup or your work environment, automating your system setup saves time and makes it easy to have a base setup if you ever need to wipe and install your system. Monitoring disk space usage on computer systems is a routine task when working with servers rather than on desktops. In this section, we'll write a script utility to check disk usage for several directories. We'll use the df and du commands to create usage reports on screen and in a file. Although this is a relatively simple task to do on the command line, writing a script makes generating reports quick and convenient, and as you've learned, the strength of bash scripting is automating repetitive tasks. We start by creating a script named diskusage.sh and making it executable. Next we create some variables to hold important information, like where the disk usage report will be stored and what it will be named. The last variable will leave empty because we expect the user to add a list of directories themselves. Let's break down the main parts of the script into smaller parts by creating functions. The first function displays help if the help option is used or if no parameters are entered. We use the OR operator, which is the pipe symbol twice, to check whether the parameter entered was the help option or was empty. We'll allow two options for this utility, Q for quick report in the terminal and R for a full report sent to a file in the reports directory. The script will exit after displaying help. This function looks to see if the directories to check variable is empty. It alerts the user to edit the script with a list of directories to check. We could have also used a config file or used the read command to get user input. In this case, we assume the user will be reasonably proficient with the command line. The script will exit if the variable is empty. The last function does the bulk of the work using a case statement to find three possible matches. The Q option, the R option, and the default option. The default option means that the user used something other than Q, R, or help. This is an incorrect option, so we alert the user and call the help function with a parameter of help. The Q option displays a summary of disk usage for the system and the directories we specified. The df command is used to check disk usage on file systems currently mounted. Here we specify the root directory with the command along with the h option to change numbers into easier to read formats. 
We add this to our script and echo another header. Next we loop through the directories we specified in the directories to check variable and call the loop variable directory. The du command shows disk usage for specific directories and can also be used with the h option. We also use the sudo command to access directories we don't have permission to. We can also use the s option to show the overall total disk space used for a directory. In our script we use the du command along with the h and s options and the directory variable. The for loop loops each directory name and shows the total disk usage per directory. The last part of this function is the r option. The script will generate a report and send it to the location in the report directory variable. Before we can do that we need to check the directory exists. The exclamation point means it doesn't exist, so we use make directory to create the directory. Next we create a variable that contains the full path to the report. We echo a header for the report and use output redirection to the report path. We also create an identical for loop as before to loop through the directories. In the for loop we add a header that will display for each directory. To show a full report of disk usage we use the C option with the du command to show totals at the end of each directory. Each time the script is run with the R option, a new report file will be created overwriting any existing one. This is because we use this redirection method. All other lines will be added to the file because we use the append redirection method. Once the report is generated, we use the default text editor gedit to display the file to the user. The last thing left to do is call the functions in the correct order. The help function, the directory check function, and the usage check function. The parameters passed with the script are held in the $1 variable and we can call the help and usage function with that value. We run the script with sudo to have permissions to create the report folder and access directories. Help is displayed as expected because no option was specified. Let's add the help option. We can see this works as well. If we try the queue option, the parameter is neither help or empty and so the check directory function executes and we are told directories need to be added. We add some directories and try again. Now the check usage function fires and the case statement matches the queue option. The df command runs and the loop for the du command goes through each directory to provide usage totals. This results in a nice summary of disk usage with helpful information headers. Let's try the r option. 
The report is generated and opens in the gedit text editor. The case statement matched the R option and created the disk usage directory. The header of the report displays the directories that have been checked and the for loop went through each directory and shows the header for that directory. The du command shows the disk usage for each directory and shows the total at the bottom because of the C option. gedit shows the file is named report.txt and is saved in the disk usage directory. The script could be extended by making it run on a daily, weekly or monthly basis using the cron scheduling system we learnt about in section 5.2. Monitoring disk usage and creating reports is a common task many Linux system administrators do on a regular basis. Automating the process for disks that need to be monitored using bash scripts is one way of making life easier, especially when you need results quickly.